Welcome to American Dreams Realized. I'm Daniel Fitzgerald, and I've spent the last 20 years helping entrepreneurs live their American dream. Traveling from coast to coast, training and consulting with hundreds of entrepreneurs, helping them to grow their businesses and create generational wealth. I wrote the book, Your Business Pipeline, the roadmap to entrepreneurial success, to show business owners how to work on their business and not in it. And I've launched the nonprofit, American Dreams Realized, founded to help entrepreneurs achieve their own American dreams by offering grants to help them succeed. Entrepreneurs starting a new business or looking to take their existing business to the next level can apply for a grant right here on AmericanDreamsFoundation.org. And on this show, American Dreams Realized, I interview leaders, rising stars, and successful entrepreneurs as we uncover how they're living their American dream. Welcome to American Dreams Realized. My guest today brings an inter international flavor, uh, Zenon Albris. Hello. Thank you, thank you for coming on board with us. Um, Zenon has a, um, a storied background uh, internationally as well as here in the States, uh, a true success story in the finance world, and uh, looking forward to hearing the tale. Thank you for the opportunity. So you are a basketball player. Uh, yes. <laughs> Played a little bit in, um, of course, high school, a bit in college, mid-majors, and spent a couple of years in Europe playing uh, not a significant role, but a but a contribution role. Yes. And you were born in Poland. I was. And, but how old were you when you came to the states? Yeah, I was uh, six months old. I realized I didn't like Poland enough, so we had to move. <laughs> Terrific. So um, you went back to Europe. Uh, tell us tell us how that transpired. Where did you Where did you start, and uh, what got you there? Yeah, it's actually uh, quite logical, not so, uh, not so strange. Uh, I was working at a large bank in Columbus, Ohio, mm. and I was part of the executive development program, and one of my very good colleagues there uh, was a Latvian American. Latvia, and this okay. was in 1992, three in that time frame. And if you recall, history at that time was Russia was opening up. It basically, the Soviet Union uh, mm. broke apart. And opportunities were being created for, for people who knew, for example, how to build a bank or a stock, stock market or so. And my, my friend was the Latvian American guy, went back to uh, Riga, which is the capital city of Latvia, and was asked to start their stock exchange. And when he was there, he met all these entrepreneurs, um, Latvian, Russian, that whole region. And uh, as you probably can guess, uh, banking is the beginning of a lot of the macroeconomic development of any country. Mm -hmm. And they asked them and said, hey, do you know any, any people who know how to build and run banks that would be interested to come out here? And um, my friend, his name is Carlos, he thought of me. Terrific, so in, you moved to Latvia and had some pretty good success stories there, right? I think we've got a, uh, I've got a, a couple of your clippings, so I hope you don't mind if we throw no, them up. No, uh, of course, yeah. Uh, and uh, some of these you may have not have seen in a while, but, uh, you know, I think they're they're very interesting. So um, so what was this? Is this an award or a certificate? It is, it is. I, uh, I wound up st spending about four, four, almost five years in the country of Latvia, um, primarily in banking, but uh, banking, insurance, as well as some other businesses. And quite frankly, that did uh, work out quite well for me. It worked out quite well for me so that the last Last year in 2000, I was nominated for a Businessman of the Year uh, candidate, and that was a great honor because I was the first foreigner to have that as a as a as an opportunity. And I came in third place, actually. Yeah, there's that young man right there. Oh, uh, very, <laughs> very, very long ago. Yeah, um, at the tail end of Latvia, I was uh, afforded the opportunity to go to Oxford University, and that was an executive development and global leadership program. And the, the nice thing about that particular picture is that was a group that, that I behind the scenes was kind of really doing things for the group. And we had the highest uh, score in the history of Oxford simulation competition. So our names are on a plaque at Oxford University. So that's kind of fun and prestigious. So you hit the ground running in Latvia. Mm -hmm. um, and then what, um, where did you go from there? Yeah, again, a, a logical step. So while, while I was in Oxford, I met a, a gentleman, a, a Polish person who was leading one of the major corporations there. 
And he kind of looked at me and said, hey, listen, you're in Latvia, you're doing business in Russia, but you're Polish born. It doesn't seem to make sense is why mm -hmm. don't you come to Poland and come work with us there? And that transpired into myself getting an opportunity to work with an entrepreneur in Poland. And, um, and that also led into some basketball opportunities where I got involved in sponsorship and ownership of a basketball team. Well, that's great. But the, um, the real basketball uh, connection happened in Lithuania. Right. Right. So, um, and Lithuania is, you're, you're explaining that Lithuania basketball there is kind of like the NFL here in the States, right? And here we are in Dallas filming. And uh, of course, the Dallas Cowboys are, uh, you know, they're. That's all anybody talks about here. So, uh, what's the what's the correlation in in Lithuania? Yeah, basketball? that's uh, I think that's a very good um, comparison because uh, they say in Lithuania the um, main religion of Lithuania is basketball. It's that important, and uh, much like here, if you're dealing with Jerry Jones or Mark Cuban or these people, but Jerry Jones, you're associated to something that's super important. And I was fortunate to be a basketball guy doing business. But because of that, in our business, I was pulled into basketball, and I met a lot of the the ministers, the uh, the professionals, the um, the entrepreneurs, and that got mm. me really well connected. and And through that, um, it got me to be somewhat of a you know someone who was uh, quite had to be social and visible and representing a company. Well, and that I got that to, looks like, uh, that's, yeah, yeah, um, you look like a GQ model here. Yeah, that was shot. in better days, slimmer days and all that. But, you know, I, I think that when you're a foreigner in these countries and then you connect with something like basketball or some, some other things, then, of course, they... They, they welcome you um, mm. they and they promote you. And I think that that was also a very important step for me and my business success that we had out there as well. Fantastic. So um, from Lithuania, uh, I know you mentioned Russia as being uh, one of the countries that you were actually looking to get to even earlier than this. Mm -hmm. And you did you did uh, make that happen. How did that occur? Yeah, again, some fortunate um, uh, opportunities in Lithuania got me visibility in the region. Of course, that was quite a one business region, and I got on the on the target list of the private the largest private equity group in Russia, who was mm -hmm. trying to build an insurance and banking um, empire, if you will, and they recruited me and invited me to go to Russia and basically work for them to do what is called here a roll up to acquire companies and integrate them and make them cohesive through systems and software and product development. And, and that went um, pretty well for us as well for those four years I was in, in Russia. So you had a lot of accolades in all four of those countries. And really, as, for, as a young guy, uh, really built a, built a name for yourself uh, in, those, in those countries. So with that success and you know, kind of like a, a cult hero over there, um, what, what brought you back to the States? Yeah, I think it was the realization that, um, you know, okay, we could joke about it, but you, you do have these accolades and you, you think you've accomplished a lot, but one of the things I didn't accomplish was probably the perfect uh, family life. And what, what happened in uh, 2010 is we were blessed with the birth of our young son. Uh. And I realized that uh, for the last 17 years in Europe, um, I was too busy uh, basically trying to be uh, a great big, uh, business person that I didn't really uh, focus too much on my family. Um, I do have a daughter, she's out there, but when my son was born, we thought really long and hard about where we should raise him and the logical place for us was of course in the United States. Mm. Okay, well, um, your, everything we've talked about so far has been in the, the, the finance world, right? And, uh, and, and what you achieved over there. When you came here, how did you segue into home services? Yeah, yeah. It's um, so the whole idea of coming back to uh, the United States. My wife and I we were targeting, actually, of all places, uh, uh, to go to Florida, Miami. Mm -hmm. But on a trip back to Connecticut, which is where I was raised, um, I uh, made a point of getting together with uh, an old high school friend of mine who was really successful in the home improvement space. Very, very successful. And he was telling me, this was 2011. So you have to think about 2011. For those of you who would remember the economic situation back then, that was the tail end of the, the Great Recession here. So you know things that were related to finance and financing, they were very challenged. 
Uh, so this entrepreneur was telling me about that things are tough because financing has dried up and and that his sales are not what they used to be. And I looked at he was obviously a super successful guy and to this day super successful. And I just kind of looked at him and I said, Larry, well, you obviously are very successful. Why don't you just build a captive finance company? And he looked uh, at him, a finance company for for the home improvement, his uh, home improvement business. He was in various he was in basements and foundations and various other things. So exactly, finance company for the home services. Okay, right? that makes sense. So um, we went ahead and, and we did that together. And uh, that wound up being my introduction to the home services, which then I learned, quite frankly, how important it is here in the United States and quite frankly, how, how noble of a business it is here as well. So what challenges did you face um, in getting into that, that home services realm? Yeah, for us, is think about it, 2011, um, trying to do finance company. Um, nobody was hurry, in a hurry to give us a license. So the really cool thing about Larry is that we were told no every time we tried to do something. When we went to get a bank, uh, try to get a license, they said, you will never get a license. Um, he said, just figure out a way to get a license. So I figured out a way to get a license. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we had to get financing and we we're told by the banks, no, it's too speculative of a, of a time and we're not ready for that. But we went ahead and put the business plans together. He wound up making the investment and then we overcame that. So we had lots of obstacles at that time to getting the, um, say the administrative and the legal side of it going up and running. But once we got it up and running, it was embraced. Because again, if you think about it back then, the big finance companies were not really providing the solutions. So we, we really became the go-to for his particular network and um, it blossomed and we were, we were fortunate enough to be able to sell it to a bank who exactly is in the home improvement financing sphere. Mm. So I was able to be around home improvements for a good three, four years at that time. And today, you're the CEO of Mycroft. Which is a home improvement uh, finance company, but very specific, very specific. Because Mycroft, what Mycroft is, is uh, it is a solution provider, a financing solution provider for the HVAC business in okay. the form of a lease to own. And what we do is we provide solutions to the subprime customer. So think about it this way. If you're less fortunate from a credit profile mm -hmm. and you have to go ahead and get a, 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 an HVAC unit when it's 110 degrees here in Dallas, Texas right. or whatever, zero degrees in Madison, Wisconsin, and you don't have a great credit profile, um, there's not very many options for you. So the founders of this company developed a really cool product, the lease to own product that enabled to provide solutions to those people who have very few options. So the thing that I've always liked about our business is we, we make an impact on two levels. We provide a, a solution to somebody who has a challenged uh, financing situation or credit situation, mm -hmm. and we help a small, a small business prosper by getting them incremental sales. So let's say a, um, a contractor is in the home and they're talking to a homeowner that has a problem with their HVAC system, right? Or their, or their hot, their water heater. Yep. And they, um, they apply for financing and they get turned down. Yes. And today, I mean, it, everything is so stringent that, yes. uh, it, it, it happens frequently. So they can then turn to Mike Ruff yes. and it's, it's a lease to own proposition. Um, what are, it seems like with what's going on today that that would be, um, you know, a very advantageous. Yeah, it's a very good point, Dan. The last two years is that the business opportunities for us to be um, impactful for our customer base are that much more so for exactly the reasons you brought up. The credit environment the last two years, the financing environment has been challenged. Interest rates have gone up. Uh, credit boxes, as we call it, have tightened. So there's less, um, less organizations that are providing options to those types of customers. And that that class of customer has actually grown. As a matter of fact, there was a statistic that came out in, in the press not too long ago that the subprime customer uh, has increased 1.2 million persons from the previous year into last year. So think about that, 1.2 million people who could have qualified for tr traditional financing no longer do. Wow. So that is our ability to, to impact those customers with a positive solution. And uh, working in the home services field, helping entrepreneurs, and that's kind of my, in my area uh, for many, many years, one of the big things that they need to be able to do is raise their closing ratios. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. meaning they go into a home 10 times, how many times do they come away with a sale? So this is very important if they are dealing with someone who is ready to buy, but they get turned down by the finance company and they don't have the, the, the cash to be able to pay right up front. So, um, so that's huge. And we're, we're in a tough time right now. So, yeah, I think you, you know, this very well is I, I believe the single, uh, most common objection for a customer to be able to take you up on your offer for a home improvement project is I don't have the, I don't have the cash. And now I don't have the credit card capacity mm -hmm. in our current environment as well. So this financing option is very critical right now, has been for the last year, and it will continue, of course, for this year until that there's a, there's a better recovery for the macroeconomic environment in 2025, hopefully. So how does the process work for a contractor to be able to um, make that, that connection with their, with their client, the homeowner? Yeah, the, uh, again, since we're, uh, we call ourselves kind of a third look solution provider, so typically a contractor would have a financing partner, which is a bank or one of the prominent financing uh, companies who provides solutions to the prime. And what we mm. do is either partner up with that contractor or with uh, that lender so that there's, a, as we call it, a waterfall effect. So if somebody doesn't get approved, so you only get one application, right? So you don't have to do a credit pool or something like this many times. So there's, is there a credit pool for Micron? For, for us, there is not a, 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 cred, a credit pool. Um, it's a little bit uh, complicated for us. For our, our core product, there's no credit pool whatsoever, and there's no hard pull um, that is with, the main, with, with, with any of the main agencies. We do have a, a better, uh, let's say, a targeted product for the, that second look category where we do uh, in fact take a credit pool at the end of um, at the end of the process but that is for a class of uh, applicant that I would call a sub near prime if that makes sense to you okay yeah but for our core product which is still 80% of our business no credit pool so we use alternate um, data sources to make wow. those decisions uh, so where do you where do you see Mycroft going now uh, over the next you know 24 and 25 yeah we're uh, we're we're lucky right now in that we are um, completing an equity raise and a uh, top up of our senior facility so what that means for us is that we could continue to grow we had a wonderful year last year and we're here to promote the company but we did grow about 65 percent last year and we do have wow. the ability to continue to grow for the next three years for sure and I think it's about product development. It's about improving our processes for making it super easy for the contractor as well as the applicant so that right. the process is seamless and kind of intuitive. We're not there yet. We're working on it. But we can do that and continue to be more impactful for those customers who could continue to have challenged um, financing situations. Fantastic. Well, that's exciting. What else would you like to to let us know in, in conclusion. Well, maybe since we're really talking about um, really a business and all, I think that through all those experiences in the different countries over many of the years, the thing that I explain to young entrepreneurs uh, about ideas and business is that uh, probably the most important thing is the right idea at the right time. Timing of a business um, idea is critical. It was actually the, the thing that as I reflect on even Morehouse, why that was successful, it was a time that was needed because there wasn't a lot of competition. Uh, if you think about what Zen House is, it's the timing. This is an aging population that needs aging in place solutions. So I believe that this will be a very good business as well. So um, if you're focusing on finding a solution, it's really you, you might have some good ideas, but really pay attention to the time. Hey, I'm um, sorry, Mycroft, the, the last two years, because of the credit challenges, the timing of being in the market at that time was what the success was last year for our growth. So yeah, pay special attention to the timing of your ideas and, mm. and run hard to execute on those ideas to be prepared for the right time. Zen and Aubrey's fantastic, fantastic guest and uh, living the American dream. And that's what this is all about. Thank you very much for coming on board today. It was great to hear your, your story. Thank you for having me. All right. So entrepreneurs, if you're uh, starting a business or you have an existing business and you want to take it to the next level, you can apply for a grant from American Dreams Realized. Uh, it's a nonprofit, americandreamsfoundation.org. Apply for the grant and begin the journey to living your own American dream. Mm -hmm.